Five Strike Final, JCM Jones from the Mothership and Dirty South Soccer. Joe Patrick from Knights Went on the Game and Dirty South Soccer is over there. Tony Award winner Nathan Lane could not make it, but Joe, we're glad you're here. I've been uh, informed about Nathan Lane that he is a Tony Award winner, is, Broadway star. Uh huh. We got to get him on the show sometime, though. We, we'll get him on the show. I mean, he, we, we keep reaching out. He keeps saying nothing at all, ever, but we're, we're going to make it happen. Uh, fortunately, I think we're going to be able to fill any dead air without Nathan Lane today. A lot of news, Joe Patrick. We're going to go through that about as quick as we can, and then we got a whole lot of questions from folks. It's been a, it's been a busy few weeks. It has. We were just talking before the show. Friday night was a glorious night for, at least for me personally. <laughs> I mean, I know a lot of our listeners here will have been happy with the the MLS news that came down that night that the players and you and uh, owners had come to a deal, but also Marcelo Zuna signed with the Braves. That was amazing. Uh, love Marcelo Zuna. On yeah. It's been, a, it's been, a, it's been a great weekend. It's been a roller coaster though, because there's been the ups and there's been the downs. So there were fun so though. Many... It feels like it's like transfer season, you know, it feels like <laughs> it's like getting, getting me going. We're really in the thick of it now. It, it's everything is fast approaching all of a sudden. I, I think you need to realize that with, the CBA getting passed. I mean, the training camp, training dates, training, everything starts on February 22nd. That's a couple yeah. weeks away. Y'all. We're, we're, yeah. we're on our way. I saw that you put that in the show notes and I was, or in the show sheet that we're working off of. And I was like, I checked the day like, Oh, that is uh that is pretty soon. That is exactly two weeks from today. So we're making it. We're making Not next it. Monday, uh, but the Monday after that, they will be training. And then you got about six weeks and the season's ready to go that first week into April. Uh, plus we have CCL coming. Uh, very, very quickly as well. Uh, that starts about the same, that first week of April yeah. as well. The as draw well. is this Wednesday. So draws this Wednesday. We'll have yeah. that covered on Dirty South Soccer. And of course, you'll see it just pretty much about everywhere. Since, of course, your 2019 U.S. Open Cup champions, Atlanta United, have vaulted their way back into CCL once again. Uh, there was some news as well with some um, format changes to that competition. Those are coming to 2023. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Like the international slots, do not worry about that. Are you talking about for CCL? Yep, they changed the format. It's very confusing. It's very large. <laughs> I was going to say, when these <laughs> things come across, I'm like, I'll worry about this later. <laughs> you should absolutely worry about that in 2023. There will probably be like stuff. a new competition at that point. There will probably be like a <laughs> Nations Cup. Is that like a thing? Nations I think Cup na- will be involved with it. Leagues Cup. Or whatever it is, we'll I have think like cup, I think counties cup. We'll have counties like uh, yeah. Trike Cities Fair Cup. Shout out Arsenal. <laughs> um, <laughs> golly, man, lots of stuff, lots of stuff. Uh, but that's that's later. We're gonna get you right to the now, folks. This is business time. Starting off with our new business time segment. We're just going through the news. It's the same shit as always. <laughs> Don't let us lie to you. <laughs> The MLS and the MLSPA, we talked about a little bit before they have agreed to a new CBA, tentative, tentatively anyway. I believe that vote is going down literally as we were. Yeah, I was going to say, we checked, I checked Twitter real quick. I checked Twitter <laughs> right before I said that. Uh, nothing yet. Nothing yet. But that vote It'll is happen. supposed to go to the full player pool today after they agreed to a tentative agreement on a new CBA on Friday night, like Joe said. After that, it goes to the player pool. They just have to get a simple majority. So that's 50% plus one of the player pool to agree to it. Uh, If the MLSPA and their lawyers and their big wigs and everyone has tentatively agreed to the CBA, that there's, it'd be insane if the players came together and said, no, actually we're, we're rejecting all of this. Uh, Those guys (laughs) are are there to not worry about this kind of things. The MLSPA is there to worry about these things. It should be easy sailing from here on out, and we're going to have a season. Here's where it gets complicated, and I'm going to try to run through these <laughs> as best I can and try to put any kind of context in to these new stipulations. I can't say too much considering who my employer is on a regular basis, but I will try to pass along the news. I can do that. I can objectively do that. This is good journalism. I like it. You put it, you put it out there at the beginning. I did. I did. Everybody I did. knows the rules. Exactly, exactly. And that's a key part of journalism. There it is. There it is. I, I'm finally using that master's degree. Thanks, UGA. <laughs> Training starts February 22nd. The season will begin April 3rd. Like we said, that's the normal start dates. That's what we had planned. There was some worry, of course, of lockout. It's not going to happen. The CBA is extended now by two years through 2027. 
Um, in exchange, the players are keeping about 100% of their salary. Uh, free agency requirements are changing in 2026 and 2027, though. Uh, those are kind of confusing. It seems to be a win for the players. They would qualify at age 24 after four years of service free agency instead of what it used to be, which was 24 and a minimum of five years. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 2026. This is like three years after the CCL changes. Uh, caps on free agency are increasing 2026. Salary budgets 2025, 2026 are getting bigger. Uh, it's not quite as big as it would have been if there had been a new CBA coming in. So that's a concession, I believe, from the players. Charter flights, though, remember they were supposed to get more charter flights. Uh, those have been pushed back a year, if that makes sense. So the charter flights they would have had. This year. In 2020, in 2020 will happen in 2021. Yes. Got it. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Because right. they had unlimited last year. Yes, that's right. That's right. The 2022 allowances go back to 2023, 2023, 2024, all the way through the end of the thing. That's going to be, I feel like that's going to be like a, a, a hard slap of reality for the players to have to go back to like limited, limited <laughs> uh, charter flights. Yes. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt your Possibly. flow, but that was, okay. <laughs> Both sides, who knows? Mm. <laughs> uh, players are also getting slightly less cut of meteor rights fees, uh, from my understanding. That's an annual meteor rights fee that is based on percentages, blah, 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 blah. Uh, a lot of that's coming from Sam Stage Call and Jeff Carlisle doing the reporting on that one. We don't know the official terms yet. We may never know the actual official terms. I'm sure Tenorio and Stage Call have something about it, though, and we, we can pretty much trust what's going on. With that. that, that's our loose rundown. Um, there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more that you really, really shouldn't worry about. The important thing is soccer's coming back. A lot more bullshit. I'm sorry. Wow. I cursed. <laughs> Seriously, when I read these things, I have no idea what they mean. I'm just like, <laughs> if it makes the players happy, then. So, I mean, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Uh, as long as everyone's chill, everyone's agreed to it. I think everyone just kind of wants soccer. And again, I can't say too much on that. But but you know what? Screw it. Screw it. Here, here's what I'm going to say about the CBA negotiations. I'm going to start with. And it's like I've been saying, Joe, this whole time, right? You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. That's exactly right. That was the lesson we all took away from that. I agree. I agree. Um, in more niche news, we're, we're going to move on to a whole lot of stuff happening in Atlanta United world. Now that we are going to have a season, it's going to be a season with a whole bunch of new players. It looks like we're saying goodbye and hello to a lot of folks very, very quickly. And first, I think we're going to start with our biggest goodbye of all this off season. I would think, I think this is the biggest one. Uh, Franco Escobar heading back on loan to Newell's Old Boys reportedly an option to buy and Matt Felipe Cardenas very much reporting on that. He's been all over it from the very, very beginning. It's a big loss and he's likely not coming back to Atlanta if I had to guess. Yeah, I. it's sad. It's sad. I have a whole take on this though. I want to talk about Franco because um, I feel like the public opinion about Franco has kind of gotten out of whack um <laughs> based on last okay. season because last season was such a weird season everybody was feeling things and um franco escobar is a guy who even before you know let's go all the way back to like mls cup his first season 2018 he had these big moments right he scored an mls cup final um he Play scored franco in, in general in, in yeah in the, in the play yeah just playing franco new york, in new york rebels yep mm -hmm. yep um, so he had all these like big moments and he clearly like, you know, earned a spot in the heart of every Atlanta United fan. Um, but when we talk to players, they would say that, you know, the team's form kind of rode and died with Franco and sometimes his form wasn't great. I think that I, I just think that his the way that people feel about him emotionally is kind of like eclipsing who he was as a player. And I think that while he would definitely be a solid player for Atlanta United going into this season. I think that also he's probably one of your few assets that has any kind of value on the market. And in a, in a time when Atlanta United is trying to really make moves to kind of rebuild this roster and do anything they can to, to strengthen it. Sometimes you have to give up a little bit in order to give yourself some wiggle room to maneuver financially. And so I think that 
you know, this is just kind of the deal. And I think that if you weren't in a situation like you are in MLS where you are constricted by all these salary rules and things like that, you would just give the player a new contract, right? Like if you were Liverpool and you have a good player, you like them, you want to keep them, you, you just give them a new contract. Mm-hmm. That can even increase their value because you then have them locked down longer term. Um, and I, if that if it was that way with Atlanta United, I'm sure – they, the club would do that with Franco Escobar. But I think that where he is now, you're looking at, he's probably at the end of his running up toward the end of his contract. You never want to go into the last year of a contract um, with a player not under uh, not, not signed long-term. So I just, I understand the move from, from Atlanta United's perspective. And I know that it hurts fans, but I think that sometimes we, we kind of, I feel like he's just been idolized to a point where we overlook his shortcomings on the field. There is so much to be said for giving a shit always. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For There's sure. So much in the minds of fans the perspectives of fans and uh, you know, Franco has always been a pretty okay player and that's kind of been the crux of the whole thing. And when he wavered, it was bad. When he vaulted above that, it was normally in big situations. And those are the kind of things that endear you to fans, you know, I think a lot of the frustration and probably more disappointment than anything is that I think a lot of us were interested to see how he meshed with Gabo Einze, especially just from a temperament standpoint. I think Mm -hmm. as players, they, they seem very much aligned in that chaotic evil mindset, I think is where we'd put them on the, on the nine square chart. Um, So, you know, it, it, uh, it's a bummer, but I don't think it's the end of the world. Uh, you hate to see yeah. important players go. You say you see players that you were attached to go, but this is not one of those things that I think we'll even look back on as like even you know Tito leaving anything like that. You know, yeah, yeah. I th- I, th- I think at right back also it's a position where um, you can find players who can fill that role um, to a suitable extent. Um, that are going to be cheaper and just e- it's easier to find those players. Like there's just a bigger supply of players because the position doesn't really require um, the same kind of technical skill um, as you need for some other positions, like where Tito played, you know, further up in the attack. It, and I think that that goes to show like, that's why Franco um, is such an interesting player because he gave so much effort, right? Like to your mm-hmm. point, he gave a shit all the time. Um, and that was really his that was like the best characteristic that he had as a player. And that's obviously in for a right back. That's huge. Cause the, the, the biggest quality you can have in a fullback really is just kind of like their athleticism and their endurance, just getting up and down the field all game. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're looking at Franco Escobar in Gabriel Lines's system, um, is he a right center back? Is he a center back in the back too? I feel like he's a kind of a tweener. You know, we talk about this in like basketball where it's like, yeah. you have guys who are, in the middle of different positions. Uh, and I feel like Franco Escobar is like that because he's not a out and out right back, right? He's not like a guy who's going to be whipping and crosses and doing that kind of thing. He's not an out and out center back. He draws lots of yellow cards, um, is very aggressive. You could be sent off in any given game. Um, and so is he only like, is his best position as a right sided center back in a back three? Like that's kind of very specific and the team would kind of have to be oriented in a way to accommodate that kind of player. So I just feel like given all these things that um, the move essentially makes sense. So it's tough to see him go, but I think it, I I think it makes a lot of sense. I think it'll make even more sense. We have some questions later about the lineup. Uh, And I I think once we kind of lay out how things might look under Gabriel Einze, it'll make a little bit more sense to, I want to add that there are rumors, rumors, not confirmed things, but rumors about uh, right back from Aberdeen. This seems Ronald Hernandez mm-hmm. coming over. That could be a very interesting addition and could be a starting addition that has a little more touch on the ball, a little more control, a little more fit in Gavalanze's system. Not the end of the world. Not the end of the world. What is the end of the world is that we're losing Eric Rometty as well. That's your, that's our, is that's it, the shared, is it? <laughs> that's the shared opinion of, of DSS and five strike final, isn't it? I mean, a okay, lot of what not. we, a lot of what we said about Franco Escobar, uh, you could say the same for Eric Rometty, just in terms of, you know, the emotional factor. He was, With you none know. of the athleticism. <laughs> 
<laughs> he was on the uh the you know the MLS Cup winning team. team. He was definitely on that team. He did um, score a goal, but if probably remember, is, yeah. he scored it from an inch away. Almost missed too. Almost <laughs> he did almost, almost miss. missed. Um <laughs> From like the highest possible XG. <laughs> 0.99 XG almost <laughs> yeah. flunked it off the damn post. Uh, but he yeah. actually no, but he but you know, we're joking, but he actually played well in that postseason. That um, postseason I remember we'll, we'll never forget him just like completely marking Maxi Morales out of the out of the game, mm-hmm. the home tie against the uh, yeah. against yeah, um against NYCFC. Just uh but he you know, he clearly was not and has not been the same guy ever since then, you know, because the next year you had Frank DeBoer come in, who was probably asking him to do different things, um, had different responsibilities and didn't really, you know, Frank DeBoer gave him a run, but he did not lock down that spot. And what were we saying all 2019 that the team looked way better when Jeff Lorenowitz played, that he was mm-hmm. kind of the the anchor of that midfield. And when Rometty played, it looked a lot looser and, um, you looked a lot more vulnerable. And I think that just continued in 2020. I mean, I can remember a game um, that they played last year on the road in Chicago where he just got bullied off the ball when he shouldn't have been, like he should have known a guy was going to come challenge him for a ball and he just gave it away uh, right in mid middle of the field. And I can't remember if it led to a goal or just a, a shot, but um, you just can't have those kinds of things. You just really need somebody more solid. And um you know, I feel bad for him because you just hate to see a player struggle like that and stuff. Yeah. But I think clearly there are better options that Atlanta United need to go to. And, you know, Carlos Bocanegra and Darren Neal's talked about this after the season, you know, that players had underperformed and that, you know, while the team was going through a really bad period last year for a front office, those times can be very constructive where you actually get to see players um, flaws quite clearly and you get to see um you know, what changes you need to make. And I think that we've been pretty positive uh, since the end of the season in terms of seems like the club really has seen those flaws and those errors in a clear manner and are addressing those things. And again, I hate it for him, but unfortunately that's an area where there's a clear upgrade. I think everyone sees the changes happening and and associates it with last year's off season where very, very good players were getting sent off and Mm -hmm. it seemed like it didn't make a whole lot of sense. This is not, this is not that. This is not that. I do want yeah. to clarify real quick before we move on that, that, that we are talking about Eric Rometty, and he's moving on to, it looks like Independiente uh, have offered to loan him for at least a year. Uh, there's a $1 million option to buy at the end, and that's been reported by Herman Garcia Grova of TYC Sports. That looks pretty much a done deal. Yeah, it seems done. And if it's if it's not, I'm sure it'll be you know, another club, but it seems like that'll be done. I, I kind of imagine some of these signings or these announcements are going to come down in rapid succession because mm-hmm. clearly the team has some, you know, uh, some players they're going to acquire, but um, it's going to be s- the, the shit sandwich way of dealing with <laughs> yeah, news, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's going to be signing announcement. Eric's gone signing <laughs> announcement, <laughs> but not only for comms. I mean, like we saw this weekend and we'll talk about it later, but like you can have a signing that you think is in the bag and then it's not in the bag, you know? So there is just, everything's kind of a shifting situation until the, the eyes are dotted and the T's are crossed. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, it's unfortunate though. You know, you, you, he's a MLS um, cup winner. And a legend for Atlanta United fans forever, mm. but unfortunately, this is the end. He's a super likable dude. Uh, he's always seemed to get along well with everybody. He was kind of the butt of a lot of the jokes in, <laughs> in the clubhouse, which was always very, very funny. He took it very well. Uh, he's very likable, like I said. But as far as contributing with the game, if you look at American soccer analysis, his goals added metric, which is not perfect, but it is a good supplement. He's pretty clearly one of the worst players on the team very, very regularly. Just not very – he didn't contribute – I, I I remember talking one time about Remedy and I think someone brought up that he like the only thing they could say really positive about him was that he helped with the, the tempo of things, which to me sounded like a just a nonsense superlative. You kind of give something. Yeah. Give someone, you know, like, oh, man, yeah. he definitely is wearing clothes every day. <laughs> Love that. Employee. Which is not, you know, you it's know? not a lie. Like, it's definitely it's true, but sure. uh, it's kind but of like it unfalsifiable. Right. Is it adding anything to what's going on? Yeah, it's, it's it never very seems big. like he added anything defensively. He certainly didn't have anything going forward. He always, always looked a step behind. He was never in position. Eric, man, bye. <laughs> That's what I yeah. got. 
Well, it's like if you, if you don't have Jeff Lorenowitz there either, it's not like you, you don't have the kind of like the backup option where it's like, okay, well, if Hermetti's out of form, then we can play Jeff. You know, it's like you need somebody you can actually, you can rely on, you know, is going to do the job. So, yeah. And the more, and the more we see without Darlington Nagby, the more I kind of go back to how just ridiculous Nagby was mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in those few years. And I, I think last year kind of exposed a lot of that in the midfield that he was yeah. covering for a lot, a lot that includes Hermetti. But Nagby was a very underrated like defensive presence. Like he, Which is he amazing made... because we talked about him all the time and we still didn't get him enough. <laughs> I know, seriously. Oh man. Well, at least there it seems to be reinforcements coming in. We're going to talk about a few of those in a second, but we do have to talk real quick and mention this in our business time segment about the dreams that never were, the dreams that came into our lives so quickly and then floated away. Uh, rest in peace, Atlanta United player Hector David Martinez. We we hardly we hardly knew you. Uh, really good center back, apparently uh, from Defensa Egestia. Looks like River Plate swooped in and picked him up before we could. Which I mean, there's a larger point I think to be made here that one analytics and everything else and everyone involved with the situation seem to indicate that he's very very good. And if we had gotten him, it would have been an excellent addition. Obviously, River Plate thinks so as well. But it seems that overall, this offseason, the the assessment of talent is getting back to a place where it seems a little more like the the pre-Frank DeBoer days. Yeah. Um, you look at the, the advanced analytics and, uh, you know, by every measure, at least the people I've talked to that are kind of in this world, they loved this signing. Toyota Football, I'll just call them out because – our listeners will know who he is, um, is one, like he was just ecstatic about this. And I typically trust him when he says something like that. So <laughs> yeah, it's uh, like, I, I mean, I have, have not been personally like scouting David Martinez or anything. Um, but yeah, it seemed like a great signing seemed like something that like kind of just a perfect fit too, for what Atlanta United needed on the back line. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we kind of got Rick rolled there, didn't we? We did, we did, but it, it's not the only move we're making. Um, and it, it seems like they have another player coming in who can also play the center back position, but may fit in very, very well in a deep line midfielder role, especially if we think about Gabriel Einza and his tendency to drop a midfielder back in possession, turn that formation into 3-4-3. Three, three. Santiago Sosa looks like he's on his way, very much is on his way, let's be real, yeah. <laughs> to Atlanta United. Uh, Literally. has already done an interview, like a man on the street type interview. It looked like local news. It was, it was a Harry Redknapp uh, car, you know, rolled down the car window. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And they're like, where are you going? He's like, well, Atlanta. <laughs> okay, cool. Let's do it, Santiago. He's a 21-year-old deep-lying midfielder. He's coming from River Plate. And the, the best part about that is the River Plate folks were, were freaking out that they were losing this guy. Seems to be very, very solid. Um, could theoretically fit in as a U22 player under that salary cap stipulation, which allows us to bring in players for a big amount of money and not have them count as DPs for whatever nonsense math you want to do there to figure that out. But good news is he shouldn't cost too much as far as that goes to the salary cap. It could be a pretty decent chance for a fee, though. Yeah. Um, so you talked about, I want to talk about the tactical aspect of this. Um, you talk about, he's a guy who could potentially be the one who drops into the back line to create the three. Like we saw that under Tata Martino with Jeff Lorenowitz. Mm-hmm. Like, so people will be kind of familiar with what that, that kind of rotation uh, or that kind of movement looks like. Um, that was mainly done in t- 2017. They started doing that before they just went full on back three in 2018. Um, but I think that Santiago Sosa, just like in, the brief amount that I've kind of seen of him on YouTube and things like that. He seems like a player that also likes to get forward as well. And when we look at a guy like him, plus a guy like Franco Ibarra, who we talked about on the last show, to me, that feels more like a two, like a, a, a double pivot, two central midfielders. Um, neither of which is kind of like the, there there's like you can picture it like a triangle and it's like as the point at the base of the triangle where you have like the anchor man w- that would be dropping in with two more central midfielders who want to push further up the pitch or is it like a triangle with the with the top with the point at the top where you have like a full-on number 10 playing behind two more central midfielders 
Mm-hmm. And that's the way I'm kind of feeling about this. With, when you look at Sosa and Ibarra, if those guys were to play together in a side, they seem more like a double pivoty type of thing. And I don't know whether that means that they're going to play four, two, three, one, which is the way like a lot of teams play with a double pivot, or you could use, you know, you could play with the back three with those two in central midfield. Um, that would probably be like a little bit more defensive approach if you were going up against, you know, an LAFC or something like that. So mm-hmm. um it's interesting the way that the that the group is shaping up. And I do think that you, when you combine those two guys with, we know that they wanted to get David Martinez. So if they wanted to get David Martinez, it means they wanted to acquire another center back. Yeah. And then you would have a center back grouping of Robinson, who we know is going to start. And then Meza, will he, won't he start? We don't really know, but then this guy would have started. So like, would that, were they kind of aiming for a back three? I tend to think that they were based on the fact that they were so interested in signing Martinez. Um, so it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see how these players are incorporated into Hanze's system. But clearly we know that either it's going to be a back three or we're going to have a back four with one of those central midfielders who's going to be dropping in and just creating that kind of passing link in the back line. I want to go back to real quick and just the quality of the player in general. And it's clear he probably will have the ability to do this just based on who was after him before uh, Everton looking at him in 2019, uh, had some success at the U20 World Cup that summer. Um, it was a roughly $15 million move was rumored for him to go to Everton, Santiago Sosa. So, I mean, this is yeah. a, this is a big one. Yeah. This is a big one. And it, it's hopefully the solidifying thing. The midfield has desperately, desperately, desperately needed. Um, and with Ibarra coming in, this is looking pretty solid. If you think about even just a three at any point, even if you did that three, five, two, there's still going to be that central three to go along with the wing backs. Uh, you've got Ibarra, you got Moreno, you got Sosa. And that sounds on paper like a very, 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 very solid midfield. Yeah, I love it. I love what this club is doing right now. Like mm-hmm. the signings I wanna they're say, making. <laughs> I want to say that I, I we, Joe can confirm this in the Slack a few days ago, I posted – like what I thought would be the starting 11 for this team and went still sucks, <laughs> still sucks. And then a few days later, everything yeah. started rolling in motion. And now yeah. I'm looking at it and go, Hey, wait a second. This is, um, this is like a, this is Columbus Toronto level right mm. now looking, you know, yeah. it's encouraging. At least could compete with those teams for sure. And what I really mm-hmm. like about these moves and par- part of this is the fact that it seems like these players are kind of like, potentially U22 players that could fit into that rule, um, which is that this team is just so much younger and mm-hmm. more full of life. You know, they've, they've got so much more <laughs> to look forward to. They've got so much life ahead of them. Uh-huh. <laughs> but seriously, like, I mean, there is something to that, I think, in terms of just like getting some more energy in midfield. It just felt like to me last year when you were like, you were alternating between Eric Rometty and Jeff Lorenowitz um, in midfield. And like, you just had kind of these, it, it felt like, um, kind of stuck in the mud to you know to an extent. Even Mateus Rosetto, not the oldest guy in the world. I think he's 25 years old or something like that. But um, you know, not like quick, not not really that kind of player that we're seeing the team sign now. So it's just really good to kind of see that energy coming into the team, which is I think is something that was desperately needed. Absolutely, absolutely. Like you said, the age is interesting because it's clear that these guys aren't long for Atlanta United. And it's interesting to see that kind of philosophy trickle down to different positions. Now, I think at the beginning, we were only used to seeing the attacking players come in as guys who could potentially, you know, come from South America, then move that path to Europe. Um, And now it really seems like it's starting to actually move to other positions. There's Mm -hmm. other positions that are kind of taking on that same feeling. Well, we, and, uh, you know, I want to touch on this because we've talked about it a little bit before, but with these U22 signings, it really is a smart move by MLS. I got to, I got to applaud the league on Mm -hmm. doing this because it really gives teams, um, the flexibility to go out and actually spend money and really invest in good players that you can actually sell on for really good value and really good profits. Like when you're restricted to buying players who are, you know, like, um, like, uh, I don't want to call anybody out. I, let's just put it like LGP, I think was signed for like 300 K or something like that transfer fee. And so you kind of luck into a situation there where you get like a good a player who's going to be good in MLS, but he was kind of on the out, not on the outs, but he was at a Estudiantes, which is not the biggest club in the world. Uh, you happen to, you know, have 
Tata Martino that could attract him. And you just like all the pieces were in place to bring in a player like that. But typically you're not going to be able to bring in a player for a $300,000 transfer fee <laughs> and then like make some huge profit on them. Like you need to be mm-hmm. able to have the, the financial strength to go out and actually, you know, pull somebody for some legit money, but then you can parlay that into actual, um, returns so you get just you just get better returns when you have this flex flexibility and so i could foresee in you know the not so distant future you see mls teams really hoovering up a lot of this young talent not just in argentina but because it can come from anywhere but i mean that's the market that these teams are going to be shopping in and it seems like a market where the players are very willing to come um it was that's that's been something that's been interesting to see over the course of a few years here where before it was like these Argentines, they would, you know, maybe you get a guy like Valeri who comes at the end of his career, but typically MLS was seen as kind of a, not a place you really want to be. And now it's really seen as, as the shop window to, to Europe, like you said. You don't have to look any further than deadline day and the content we put out around it and the response to it from people in Europe, from people like Greg Berhalter, uh, you know, any of those folks are looking at this and seeing that MLS is a league that is developing talent and European teams are taking notice. And that's a positive feedback loop keeps going and going and going. And Joe, I think you're spot on. I think eventually we're going to see more and more folks like that brought in. However, sometimes you have to bring in folks who do not fit that profile at all whatsoever and are confusingly still there. Welcome, Cubo Torres, back to Atlanta United. <laughs> Player coach, maybe, or it. something? <laughs> I don't get it. Uh, I mean, he is back. Um, yeah. But there's a, there's a log jam in front so of him. He- so he's going to be on the senior minimum salary, which means Great. that he will not count against the budget at all. Like right. not even that salary will count against the budget. He's on the, I forget what it's called, the off budget roster or something like the supplemental roster, I think is <laughs> the name of it. Great. Something like that. <laughs> oh man. But yeah. So Kubo's back. I mean, uh-huh. to be fair to him, uh, if you're judging him based on last year, it's really tough because he was coming into the team from not playing and it was just very hard for him. He was injured. He, I forget what he hurt, maybe a knee or something not long into his playing day, uh, into his, at his actual playing time in Atlanta and just never really gotten a rhythm. So um, he is younger than any of us expected. (laughs) That was, that was, that was the breaking news from, from that signing was that everybody (laughs) actually found out how old Kuba Uh Torres is. Amazing, amazing. I, I, like I said, there's a lot to get. Sancho Lopez, Corey Joseph, and then Jackson Conway. Um, if Cuba Torres gets more minutes than Jackson Conway this year, I'm going to feel very frustrated by that. Yeah. As someone that really believes in playing the kids and wants to see Jackson Conway do well, which we think he can. Someone had a good point where it's just like, translator, you get, you get a, there's a translator on the field. Absolutely. You know, you can never have too many of those. So, um, Absolutely. And, and, and again, with this stuff with him working with the academy kids, it seems to be a, a pretty consensual thing where. Shouldn't have said that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. Uh, in a sense, it's it's kind of similar to the Sandra Lopez signing, in my opinion, where it's like you're getting it's well, again, an old player. Cuba Torres is 28, so he's not nearly as old as Lissandra Lopez. But, um, you know, he's just a, he's a player who can help you in ways that aren't necessarily going to be between the lines, you know, on a on a Saturday. Yeah. Um, but he can help in other ways. And especially if he's not counting totally. against the budget, then, you know. Then, like for me, when I first heard the news, I was like, "Whoa, what?" And then right. when he's not on the budget, it's like, "Okay, that makes a lot more sense." Yep. So he's back. There we go. It's just one more roster thing. Uh, not too much to worry about. Adam John does leave as well. I don't know if that happened before we did a show or not. I can't really remember when it happened. It seems like it's always been that way. Who really knows? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have some other players to welcome back too, though. Uh, Kevin Kratz. People were like, "Stuck." Yeah. Kevin Kratz, baby. <laughs> like <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are weird. I underrated the Kevin Kratz love. Honestly, I did we, not we know it was so strong on the site. I mean, the the flow of quote tweets and like love and comments coming out today it was like we had brought back Almiron. Like I, it was. <laughs> it really was. I mean, but like think about it. it's. It really is the like tell your best two jokes then get out of there philosophy. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> Kevin Kratz came in, played like five minutes of every game, kicked in two free kicks, and everyone went, that's my favorite player. Yeah. Yep. That's it. That's, that's pretty it. much that's it. That's all he had to do. You love it. Uh, he's working with the Academy kids, it looks like. I'm sure he's teaching them free kicks and all sorts of fun things. Kevin Kratz, welcome back to the organization. Super like, I love Kevin's time. I, I do want to say that Kevin Kratz was just an awesome dude. Love uh, yeah, he did one of my favorite interviews that I've ever been a part of, honestly, uh, like media sessions. It was it was of MLS Cup week, and he was just talking about what it was like to experience playing under Tata Martino. And it was fascinating because mm-hmm. he's a guy who, you know, German comes from that kind of European style uh, approach to the game. And he just talked about how working with Tata was just like a total reversal of the way that <laughs> of like the way that a team prepares tactically, mm-hmm. which is it, to kind of go into it like Tata's approach was you first figure out the ways you can hurt the other team based on their vulnerabilities. And then you work backwards when you're building out your tactics of like, first you figure out the attack and then you figure out how to cover yourself when you lose the ball and you lose those situations. Um, as opposed to most, you know, like the, the most managers would say you protect yourself first. How do we protect our goal? And then you build your attack off of that. So interesting stuff. He, he was much more eloquent in the way that he was talking about it, but um, cool to have him. Maybe he'll implement some of that stuff uh, with the club. A couple other news items to get to. We almost, almost folks came so very, very close to the return of PT Martinez to MLS in all places, of course, uh, Cincinnati. Cincinnati were the ones who were apparently in for PT. He denies that on social media. Looks like he's staying without a seer. Uh, just a quick update on him. Two goals and three assists in 13 games for PT. And Alan Asir seems like things are going pretty much about the same as they've gone everywhere else with PT. So there you go. There <laughs> what, you are go. The cha- what are the chances they had a deal and then he like Googled Cincinnati, Ohio? Just like check it out. <laughs> Skyline chili. And I was like, oh, I'm fine here. I, I love just, it here. It's spaghetti? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. <laughs> and left. That's, that's the whole thing. Um, one more final news item at Lane United announces the only team to get a third kit, which is very, very funny. It's rumored to be maroon. There you go. That's all we really know about the third kit, but hopefully there's some interesting designs coming in. Uh, do want to plug a quick story I did on Philadelphia's new uniforms where they brought fans into that entire process. Thought it was super interesting. Had them sign NDAs and everything like that. Um, hopefully Atlanta United maybe can get on that same kind of path where they really get the folks, uh, the fans involved, you know, and making those kind of decisions could be a lot of fun. That's on MLSsoccer.com. That's on the mothership. And that is a business time done and dusted Ooh. to the questions after a quick break that was like my my ira what's his face npr voice at the end there ira after yeah what's his name a quick break this is five strike final <laughs> anyway Dude. my favorite my favorite podcast voice is michael babaro i'm i'm michael babaro michael babaro <laughs> and it's like his his voice Today's is like right up against the topic. <laughs> Today is GameStop. Yeah. This what is what is happening? <laughs> I fucking hate it. It drives me insane. But I listen to that show every yeah, day. It's, I don't know. Uh, like, you gotta listen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who's the idiot? It's not. It's not Michael Navarro. That's for sure. All righty. Um. <laughs> Where's my time? It's not keeping my. I'm at 38. Oh, f- uh... Huh. Okay. This is weird. I don't know why it's not. Usually, like, audition will show my time elapsing. Yeah. But it's not doing that. And for a second, I thought it had cut off my audio, but no, it hasn't. I'm still recording. But I don't know the time when that break started. Anyway. I just always like oh. to make a note when we go into break, just so I, totally. like when I go into edit. It looked like I 38. I guess you'll have it on your side. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I'll go back in and add me talking over you for the, the bit. That was, oh, okay. you, you were right. I just didn't do it. I just didn't okay. execute correctly. <laughs> 
<laughs> my dumb bit. It's okay. It's preseason. Uh, it's preseason for us too. You know, we're just <laughs> still trying to get in the flow here. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and I've got this. Like, did you get? Did you see the uh, stuff that Lucid sent? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't really look at it. I thought it was the same old stuff as always. <laughs> honestly, it's so bad. Like, yeah. it's uh, like it. Everyone knows. It and I've point. never. Everyone's gonna I've, be surprised by it. I very rarely actually read straight from there the right. stuff that they send like new cloth masks 2.0 <laughs> cool. that's what they're calling it i guess uh, um <laughs> i don't I, I don't think they kind of like grasp the concept like it would be better if we just talked about it or something casually um and they just gave us like some bullet points anyway I'll uh I'll just do that on my own. They're, and they're and artists, man. I get it. They I know. Want, yeah, they, they are. They yeah. They they want to you be know. creative. Yeah. Uh, um. I'll just do that. I'll send you uh two clips. I'll send you one of just my raw audio here that I'm recording, and then I'll also okay. just record the bit to plug in. Sweet. Um. I've I've, I've got, remind me to go back and cut me talking about Cubo doing anything consensually. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, said it. And I, I, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. Oops. That's too funny. Yeah, that was bad. That was not good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> All right, you ready? I'm ready. Wow, what a break. All right, you guys had questions. You guys had questions, and we're going to go through as many of them as we can. There were, I think we had like 40 something responses at this point. Goodness, y'all. Wow. Y'all are the y'all only going time crazy we ever like being ratioed. Exactly, exactly. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll start here with this first one. Uh, we did touch on a few of these. We're going to try to get to as many as we can. A lot of y'all ask the same kind of questions, but we'll start with a general question from Red Velvet Stan, Joel Betts, Jonathan, and Greg all kind of asked the same sort of thing. And Joe talked a bit about it with his idea for a double pivot, but they were wondering if we could discuss our expected starting lineup. And if I had to go right now, Right now, it looks like Barco, Joseph Dam up top, a midfield of Marcelino, Ibarra, and Sosa, and then a back line of Bella, Bello, Meza, Robinson. And then, as someone I want to advocate for, I think Brooks Lennon is the starting right back right now. Basically, because of how Gabriel Lines' system works and how it sets up and how it allows the fullbacks to really kind of get forward. Again, it turns into that 3-4-3 three, three possession, uh, sometimes that 3 Three one three, all that kind of thing. Three one three three, whatever it is, and mm-hmm. uh, those guys play a lot of role. They're going to have to be good on the ball. Uh, Bello can obviously do it. Lennon can obviously do it. I think that's the most effective option right now. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with your with your eleven there. You essentially have like Barco playing on the left and Dam on the right in like a front three. Yep. Um, I would say Eric Lopez is the guy people will bring up as somebody who maybe should be in this conversation. Uh, I think just well, because. Yeah, I think just because of his age, like it'll be better for him and easier for him to work his way in coming off the bench, at least at the beginning of the season. And there's still going to be so much rotation because there's going to be a lot of fixture congestion with all the competitions that Atlanta United is going to be involved with. There are going to be so many um, games and so much playing time that he'll get his fair share. And honestly, like, I don't know if even it's a weird question because Gabriel Heinze will not know his best 11 when he starts, you know, when he rolls the ball out there for the first game, the second game, the third game, you know, he probably won't know until the very kind of end of the season, what his best lineup looks like. So it will be interesting. And I think that what's fascinating about this is that all these guys have chances to kind of work their way in or out um, of the lineup. But I think that what you have set here, um, what you just outlined is I I would totally agree with that. I think I would say Lennon is the right back as well. I know, Jurgen Dam has been a guy who people have kind of wondered whether he, not he not that he would play right back, but would he play right wing back? Mm-hmm. That is a possibility, I guess. But right now, I'm not accounting for that. Like I I'm just that. I'm only put, slotting him in as a potential right winger. So, pardon, I've got a siren going past me. <laughs> oh, it, it, it's 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 the police chasing after Jurgen Dam into a Pollo Loco. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about Dam in a second. We had a few questions as well on that, but we have an interesting question here from Jake who asked, who's essentially assuming the same thing as us, that Marceline Marino is making his way into the starting club pretty easily. Of course he should uh, as, as a DP player, uh, but he wants to know about the potential of Marcelino and Einze's system 
doesn't feel like he's heard too much about it and how he will fit. And it's a really good question. I think that's maybe the part where I'm most unsure of is the, the midfield central two and that three, four, three. I know they rotate in and out a lot. It's all about kind of coming back to the ball, rotating in and out um, and making triangles that way. It's a very, very fluid thing. But my thought is who will be the guy tasked most with progressing the ball forward from the midfield. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, especially he's a guy who can really carry the ball. We saw that when he first came mm-hmm. into the team. Like he can do kind of is uh, very Almaronish in the way that he can just receive the ball, you know, in his own third and just literally and just sprint up the field with it, which is a very easy, convenient way to progress the ball when you don't have, especially when you don't have a team full of like, you know, intricate passers. So um, I think that his potential is very high. So the 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 thing about Marcelino Moreno, I think the the kind of the guiding characteristic that we can we need to think about him is he loves to take players on like when again talking to Toyota football when this signing was made last year he was like shocked at uh I think he may was like led the league by a large amount of his like average take-ons per game and average dribbles per game but he's not super successful with them like not like at a extremely low rate but just dribble success is just something that you're never going to have a super high percentage of doing so unless you're Lionel Messi or something. So um, he's a player who's going to try things. And I think that that's what Atlanta United needs. Cause like Barco is a guy who we see oftentimes get the ball and he kind of, he wants to kind of wait and pick that perfect pass. And I think that Marcelino Moreno is going to be a guy who's a little bit um, just like a, a nice kind of difference to that style where he's just going to be more aggressive and assertive and taking players on, especially in the final third. So um I really like the prospect of like him and Barco and Bello kind of linking up and kind of that left channel. When you think about Bello would be the guy who's kind of overlapping, giving you the width. Barco's the one who's on the left, cutting in on his right foot. And Marcelino Moreno is kind of in the middle, making things happen. And I think he's left footed. So he, he could also be a guy who could just interchange really well with that left side. So I think it's really interesting. And I think that, you know, his potential is quite high, although he is not, he's not like the same age as a guy like Ezekiel Barco. He's much more in the middle of his career, but, Physically, I mean, Marcelino Moreno seems like a, a player who's, you know, in his prime and and is going to be potentially a guy that they could sell on um, if, if he does well, even though yeah. he's kind of at the later stage. I think the main answer to, to how he will fit is well. I think he'll fit well. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the main thing. Um, we'll figure out the the more detailed part of it as we kind of go along here. And, and like Joe said, yeah, Alanza will too. Uh, But we might not be done. That might not be our final 11. That might not be even players who are even left by the end of this thing. Uh, There's a lot of off season left and we have a couple questions about transfers coming in. And I'll start with this one from Payson, Jake, and Michael, uh, who all had the same kind of thought with Martinez deal falling through. Do you think they're going to keep searching for a center back to pair with miles. And I, I think, that, I think we've already hinted at this, but I think the question there is, is kind of twofold. It, it obviously comes back to, are we going to be in a back three or three center backs? Um, and if we're in a back four with two, is that center back we're bringing in going to be someone to replace Meza or back him up? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I don't think they're locked in necessarily to the center back position. You just need somebody who's comfortable um, in that role. So like, a Jeff Lorenowitz style of player, somebody who can anchor in midfield and drop in and be that guy. That could be a type of player they go out and get in, you know, with, with Martinez out of the picture now. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily like you're looking straight at center backs, but you still need some, you need somebody who can do center backy type of things in terms of, you know, defending and being able to kind of pass the ball around the back, which Martinez was apparently uh, quite good at. So I don't think that they're necessarily will have to go out of center back it just depends on what the market looks like. And they would have a lot. I don't really have any insight in terms of, you mm-hmm. know, what players may or may not be available out of that South American Argentine market, but not necessarily, I would say. I will say guys, we're never going to be able to answer like what player do you think they're, they're looking at right yeah. now? Because there are quite literally like thousands of ten thousands of players that exist in the, in the world we, we just don't know how to really narrow it down because it'd be insane to try and do it except if you're joe and you're playing football manager and you're doing some <laughs> right, sleepers right. yeah on dirty yeah. south soccer <laughs> um, but it brings up a good point about the market in general and this comes from ryan mcmanus who was asking more about the south american pipeline that we seem to kind of be getting back to it and i think that kind of is the central 
thought of the question. You know, South American versus Euro manager was a big question, but after having signed several players with European pedigree under DeBoer, we are now almost exclusively recruiting Argentines. With the benefit of hindsight, did our vaunted South American pipeline dry up under DeBoer? And I want to point out something real quick and say that I don't know if necessarily we were pour, pouring in, pulling in more European folks necessarily. Um, I think it kind of seemed like that, maybe because more of the prominent folks, uh, Heinemann, Moraney, uh, were coming in from Europe. But I mean, if you look at it, the, the signings that were brought in that weren't MLS guys under Frank DeBoer, boy, this should tell you something as I'm looking at this list. Um, Heinemann, <laughs> Europe, Moraney, Europe, Dion Pereira, Europe, and then Florence and Pagba were the European dudes. Um, then you got Mesa from Mexico, uh, Joseto, Castro, and Eric Lopez all from South America. Those are, those are your Frank support. <laughs> Jesus yeah, and you're condemned and in Mexico as well. And you're condemned. Yeah, I, I couldn't remember when exactly he came and I forgot to look it up. It happened when we were all in our 2020 slumber in the middle of last summer. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Nobody That's right. Want, was or wanted to pay attention. Um, <laughs> this is, I think, one of the most interesting questions around Atlanta United um, and the club's history. Um, It's something that I've talked a lot about with Felipe because, you know, I remember we talked about um, at Frank DeBoer signing, there was obviously like the culture clash. And we've talked a lot about this on this show as well. Just kind of like that (laughs) kind of the weird culture, the weird vibe. Um, And it did seem like something that the club was making. um, They were really trying to um decouple themselves from being tied to like this Argentine talent pool, both in terms of the players and the manager, I would say Um, they wanted to kind of like broaden their horizons, expand their network um, in both players, coaches. We've seen that they've done this deal with Aberdeen in Europe. Um, So they've done these different things. And I think that what we're seeing is this year, they're going back to um, they're not like as concerned about that aspect of it. It seems like they're much more focused right now on just acquiring the best talent for the best money. Like there aren't these other considerations involved. Um, And so I, uh, that's kind of like where I'd leave it. I wouldn't say that the South American pipeline ever like dried up. I don't know if that's the way I would have phrased it. It was like a conscious move to go away from it is kind of how I understand the situation. And now they're, they're going back to it. Yeah. I'm generally not sure how much of that is on DeBoer. Yeah. How much of that is just missing on Aceto and Castro. Like if those mm-hmm. guys were good, maybe we're talking about how great our South American pipeline stayed under DeBoer. You yeah. know, these guys haven't been good. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that may be the big thing is I don't know how much, um, and we don't know yet how many avenues having Gabriel Linesa has opened up into better South American Definitely. players. We're assuming that's going to improve though. And, and it seems to be the case with who we're targeting. Um, and I'm, again, I'm not sure if that's just because of who was identified or because it was completely impossible under DeBoer. And we may never know. And well, and it is interesting if you think about it, go back to that video where they, with the club kind of took it behind the scenes. Uh, and I think, I think it was in that video, you know, what I'm talking about when they were like in the airport going down to meet with. Uh, oh, Gabriel okay. I, for that, some reason, I thought you were talking about Frank DeBoer's first meeting. With oh, no. Where he asked Julian Gressel <laughs> a question. Julian Gressel just stared at him like, what are you talking about? Anyway, continue. <laughs> something about the hunted or something. Um, yeah. But he said, but Darren Neal said that they were going down to look at meet with coaches, plural, um, not just one coach, which would have been Gabriel Heinze. Um, so it does seem like maybe uh, the manager if it wasn't Gabriel Heinze, the manager would have been another man, uh, somebody else from, from Argentina, which could mm-hmm. have opened up doors. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe it plays a role, but I get the sense that it was uh, kind of an overall club move to kind of go away from just kind of restricting themselves or constricting themselves to that region. And again, it goes back to the, the overcorrection thing. You know, they're going to come back from this now. And it, it's almost certainly going to be some kind of a form of overcorrection, I think, from Frank DeBoer, because you have to get the PR back. You have to get that feeling back. And so what you're going to do is you're going to go away from anything kind of even tangentially related to, to that philosophy, right? You're going to come back and, and really go after the folks that are going to make people feel warm and fuzzy about Atlanta United again, which are the, the South American guys. It, it's yeah. kind of how it works right now. Um, and, I, and I wonder, talking about that, like, I wonder if for the players, if, if, you know, the ones that have been around for Frank DeBoer, where 
you know, the, the reports were that it was kind of like under management to an extent, like mm-hmm. there was not as much, like it wasn't as physical, uh, a lot more time off, um, not as much like direct instruction and that kind of thing as to whether like the players will have to deal with a different approach on the field to the way that Heinze will want to, you know, manage this team, which is going to be high intensity, lots of instru- like that kind of thing. So right. it'll be interesting. Yeah. And again, not to say that like overcorrecting is bad or anything like that. I don't mean it in the sense that like they're going to overshoot the mark and end up in a yeah, bad yeah. place. I just say that I think they're swinging back the other way. Mm-hmm. And that's just how it's going to kind of be for at least a second. Anyway, and hopefully going forward, honestly, like you, you look back to what we said initially with the DeBoer hiring, what I remember saying, I remember going on 929 after MLS Cup. And the first thing I said was, got to get a South American manager. Just got to yeah. do that, right? Yeah. Um, it, it didn't didn't did work out that way. So, I mean, we knew from the beginning. We, we had thoughts about it from the beginning, and clearly it took a risk. It didn't work out. And now we're getting back a little more to normal, it seems like, at least in Atlanta, United world. Uh, there's still maybe some changes coming, though. And it, we want to hit on this as best we can, but please keep in mind that MLS roster rules are dumb. No one knows how much allocation money Atlanta United actually has. And we don't really know how any of it works because (laughs) they don't know how any of it actually works. So what I want to talk about here is a question from Jake. He asked, what's your opinion on damn starting caliber or does Atlanta need to go out and get a right wing? Um, and, And my thought here is there is a potential world there's a potential universe that exists where Marcelino Moreno gets bought down with allocation money from that DP spot and there is a DP spot available to go get a right winger and I think if you add that in with all the other pieces right now uh, if you assume that like Hernandez is coming in at fullback and everything like that if you add a DP right winger right now to this team that's something real scary it is um You know, yeah, it's always it's always nice to like think about the idea of adding an attacking player like that for sure. Um, But I would say, you know, my counter to that would be that um, it may not be the the best allocation of resources uh, Mm -hmm. because you have you do have Dam. You also have a guy like Eric Lopez, who is more of a creator type. Um, maybe See, a this is bit... where we're going to disagree because we don't know anything about him. Isn't oh yeah, the, all, and all, Lopez, all the, these all opinions don't... are based off of uh, one yeah. like sixty minute <laughs> performance <laughs> in a in a friendly, <laughs> essentially a glorified friendly. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, so already declaring him a borderline starter, all that jazz. Yeah, I guess to your to your point, like if if that is the the approach you're taking, then yes, you you may not have as much depth there as you think. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so he would be a. a somebody you look at i think that see it's interesting because i think that if the team were to have signed martinez i'm not sure this david martinez guy i'm not sure if he would have um uh been a u22 player because i think he's 23 and i'm not sure if the date would have i'm not sure when his birthday was if if he could have been squeezed yeah he's 23 that's right yeah Yeah. so and that would have been i think it was rumored for like a three three and a half million dollar deal yeah, which would definitely put him in Tam solidly in like a as, as like a solid Tam player, uh, which may have which may mean that if you do that, then you are not able to buy down Marcelino Moreno, which essentially mm-hmm. means that he like you're, essentially he's like o- occupying a DP spot if you if he were to come in. Um, so all that to say, it seems like the club was is not kind of looking at that route at at, at fortifying the right wing position with that kind of player. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, to your point, if you don't know, if you don't feel comfortable with what you have in Eric Lopez, then maybe that is something that you want to address. And it does certainly seem like they're, they do need to add some sort of winger, whether it's a, uh, whether it's a, a starter or a depth piece. I definitely think that, that is a, a position that needs a little bit more, uh, depth. Wouldn't you love to have Tito Viaba coming off the bench? Ooh, ooh God, be man. Golly, I'll always go back to that one as being the one that really indicated things were, were getting weird. But yeah, and shout anyway. out to Felipe by the way, who did a great piece uh, catching up. Oh with, yeah, totally catching up with Tito. That was that was a that was a really fun read, and it was good to kind of hear that he still thinks positively of his time here and all that jazz. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think we maybe need to go back to the original question too, and just kind of answer that. What would our your thoughts on Dam. I've, I've kind of repeatedly said that I'm still not convinced that Jurgen Dam is actually good at soccer. <laughs> um, no, there's been no real evidence to prove that he is, and he is at that kind of level, uh, but he might be the best option right now. And if you have that kind of speed, 
I guess that's not a terrible option to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. To me, he is a, he's definitely a very flawed player who will frustrate people like to no end during this coming season. Like I'm sure people will be like tearing, (laughs) pulling their hair out at times. (laughs) It's going to be awesome. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i know seriously cannot wait for that Ser- like le- legitimately cannot wait to watch that um but i also think that his you know his strengths obviously and his speed is a functional characteristic that is going to help the team like if you have that aspect to your game like we saw i mean tito fialba was that kind of player for a long yeah, time like he absolutely. was just sprinting down that right side and he wasn't the most gifted like crosser of the ball. Uh, we knew we know he could rip a shot, but like passing wise, he wasn't the best. But because he was able to have that comp- that kind of flow with Julian Gressel down that right side, they were very effective. And I think that Jurgen Dam can be have that similar kind of effect if he, you know, um, the overall tactics of the team need to kind of create opportunities for him to get into those spaces. But I think if he does. All you got to do is put the, you know, just pass the ball to the penalty spot. And yeah, <laughs> just really is going to get on his fair really share of the end of them. So exactly, exactly. Just pick the, the space out and just put it there. I mean, because that speed is real and it's something the team really doesn't have anywhere else right now. You know, but, you're not going to rely on Zeke to get in behind people. You're yeah. Just Let, I just want to also say something as somebody who like has not played this sport beyond like the recreational level. Um, like, why is it so hard? Like, I feel like developing crossing should be something that's like very easily done. Like, like I feel like every player should be able to be taught how, like, how to consistently put a ball in. But even, I mean, I see it. Like, I, my favorite teams in the world, uh, like with the best players in the world, sometimes yeah. like cannot for the life of them get a a corner kick past the first defender. So mm-hmm. who knows. It's strange, but I, I don't know the answer to that either. I don't think they know the answer because it's to like, that. it's just like solid technique, right? It's just like it's <laughs> it's purely technique. Based. Okay, sorry. Uh huh. Right, right, right. And that's why you always miss one hundred percent of the worms that don't fall from the tree. <laughs> um, all right, those were good questions, y'all. We appreciate that, but we had some other questions that we wanted to get to, but maybe didn't have the time to go in too deeply. This is rapid. Fire. Joe, Jake asks, if ATL ever bought an old superstar DP, who would it be and why? Miguel Almiron, for obvious reasons. <laughs> I said Ballo for the memes. I think that'd be hilarious. He wouldn't fit at all, though. My actual answer was like Hamas, maybe? Hamas, yeah. like, a, like a midfield kind of DP. I think if they ever Sexy, went like an old like... DP route, right? Like it would be a yeah. midfielder. Does that make sense to you, like sure. on some level? I don't know. Sure. That's what, that was my thought. Whatever. Um, next question comes from Bart. Best thing you've bought since the season ended that isn't soccer related. Oh man. See, this is tough for rapid fire because I always want to like rack my brain of like all the things. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just like looking around now. Do you have anything that you know of this mic? Oh, okay. Yeah. That's the best thing I got for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking Five, more like this, like four, silicone spatula three, that I got. That oh, is God, amazing. Dear Lord. Dear Lord. All right. Adam <laughs> ask uh, Georgia Clemson prediction. That's all the way in all, September. Um, Adam, I think, I think, I think Venable's game plans and, and shuts down Georgia's offense. Georgia loses that first game, but then goes on to the SEC championship after all that. And then loses to Bama. Go to walks. Uh, Michael ask best interview on the team. It will always be Joseph for me. Joe, your thoughts. Joseph. It's definitely Joseph. I is we I feel like we need to have a back we need to have number two here. Oh gosh. Is, the, is there is there a backup? Uh Jeff's Jeff gone. Le- yeah, Jeff, <laughs> no, Jeff, we both are like just <laughs> gone. That's why this is an interesting question. Um man, uh uh, uh Maybe, uh, he's maybe, fun. maybe, yeah, he's maybe Jurgen. Maybe you Jürgen. like him a lot. That's something we didn't mention in our Jurgen Dam segment. That he yeah. is super likable and he like lives for Atlanta United now. Apparently, he's going on like Mexican radio stations and talking about like, man, if they <laughs> yeah. give him a salary cap, Atlanta United come down here, kick your all's ass. Somebody, so My I don't, I could totally beat up your dad. I don't pay attention to like Instagram or TikTok or anything, but somebody posted a picture or a video of him like shop he was like at a grocery store, he's like at a Publix or something, and he's in his full Atlanta United like training gear. <laughs> the Atlanta United mask. Like he's like, that's definitely like, that's an Atlanta United player. <laughs> always be pushing the team. Always be hustling. Uh, Brooke asked for those of us who have tuned out of soccer and sports in general for the pandemic. What's the too long. Didn't watch synopsis. We should know going into this year for Atlanta United Joe one sentence going into this year for Atlanta United. 
Everything was so bad that they realized they had to revolutionize the team. We're sexy again. There you go. Uh, Greg asked, did Han shoot first? Do you know yes. what he's referring to? Yes, yes, he did. Yes, he yes. did. The well, yes, is on the show. Yes, is on the, yes is on the show sheet. Yes is the, the answer on the show sheet. <laughs> let's so not I'm going with yes. the character. Come on. Let's let's think about the character development. It's much more powerful if his redemption arc includes him being a bad person at the beginning. All right. That was yes. we did it. We got through all of it. We got through so many questions today. I'm very proud of us. It's like an original was good. Start final episode. Uh, very, very happy with that uh joe any last thoughts before we get out of here my only last thought is that i am very excited to be doing a lot more of these coming soon i know that people have been uh giving us a hard time for being so <laughs> sporadic with these which i totally understand because we have sure. been very sporadic but we don't want to do shows when we don't have anything to talk about so it's so great now that we have news coming in and we will be bringing a lot more to you guys soon lots of big things on the way stay tuned for a couple surprises as well really we're looking forward to them. We're looking forward to them. We think you will too. Uh, season starts April 3rd. Training starts April 22nd. We're closer and closer and closer. And we'll be with you for the entire year. Looking forward to it. We love you. Bye, y'all.